So, let's begin. Main man. Main man. Main man. Main man. Main man. Now that's a very interesting story. All the people that were working for Main Man were unusual. We were loud, ugly Americans, basically. Hello and welcome to the first episode in our series that explores the history of the company synonymous with the hedonism and excess of the rock and roll scene in the early 70s. Main Man. We were going to have no money, but we were going to have a fabulous adventure. Main Man was a rights management organisation formed by entrepreneur and empresario Tony DeFries that helped to develop the careers of artists including Iggy Pop, Lou Reed, Mick Ronson, Mop the Hoople, Ian Hunter, Mick Ralphs, Dana Gillespie, Amanda Lear, John Mellencamp and David Bowie. I think that throughout the 60s and most of the 70s I was driven by lust. <laughs> as much as anything, oh, it's a great creative force. Tony's vision for Main Man and his aggressive promotional and marketing focus resulted in Bowie's transformation from pop wannabe to rock megastar. I was once described as the manager, the mentor and the visionary who went to the theatre with an unfocused dilettante and raised the curtain on a superstar. With behind-the-scenes stories from those who lived and breathed the heady excesses of the period, we're delving into the Main Man archive to present an evocative walk on the wild side. Now that I'm on a roll... If you want to have a first-class life, you have to move first-class. When he formed Main Man, Tony staffed the offices in London and New York with several of Andy Warhol's team from his factory, including Cherry Vanilla, Jamie Andrews and Lee Black Childers, all of whom we'll hear from later in this series. How's this going? Is it okay? I tend to get loud, so, you know, you know if I get all wrapped up in something, but I'll, I'll pretty much talk like this. We begin the story in New York City with the man who was the president of Main Man's North American operation and was able to provide a very important introduction to Andy Warhol for the young, ambitious David Bowie. Nowadays, I'm Tony Zanetta, but when I worked at Main Man and when I worked with Tony DeFries, I was Z. We had a lot of Tonys. We had Tony DeFries. We had a bodyguard named Tony Frost. We had another bodyguard named Anton. And then we had Tony and Gracia, who you will hear a lot about in a few minutes. So I was Z. And still people who I know from those days call me Z. I spent a lot of years trying not to be Z anymore. And it's funny because the more time that's gone by, particularly since uh, David's death, this all is getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, and people want to know about it, and they're fascinated by everything that happened 50 years ago. It's still very uh, on everybody's mind. So I'm more comfortable with it now, and I, uh, I don't mind talking about it at all. It was a great time in my life. Tony has a great story to tell, and when he gets on a roll, there's no stopping him. So it's just best to hit record and let him go. My story starts in 1970. I'd been in New York a couple of years, and I'd wanted to be an actor, but I was a little timid about it. But but then I had put my toe in. Uh, I liked doing very broad, loose work, which led me to the Playhouse of the Ridiculous and the genre of theater of the ridiculous. So in 1970, I went to see a play called Night Club, it was done by the Playhouse of the Ridiculous, and that was kind of a big turning point for me. I just wanted to jump on the stage with them. And coincidentally, a couple of weeks later, there was an ad in the trade papers for a play called World, Birth of a Nation by Wayne County, directed by Tony and Gracia. Now, I had met Tony and Gracia because he was from Massapequa, Long Island, and my college roommate was from Massapequa, Long Island. <laughs> so I met Tony and Gracia. He was one of the first people I met when I moved to New York. And Tony and Gracia was a, a very large man. He was tall. He was very overweight. He was about 400 pounds when I met him. He was a writer. He was a director. He was an actor. He was hilariously funny, loud, vulgar, could be really vicious, a little bit scary. But I was drawn to him when I first met him. And he grew up in Massapequa with my roommate Tom from college and with a boy named Jimmy Slattery. 
who became Candy Darling. They all grew up in Massapequa. I soon met Candy Darling after I moved to New York. So I was aware of this sort of um, underground world, but I didn't totally jump in yet until 1970. So I went to an audition. Now, now Ingracia had aspirations for kind of a legitimate theatrical career. However, don't forget, he's the 400-pound boy growing up in the suburbs of New York. He was uh, pretty much a freak. You, you can't hide when you look like Tony and Gracia. So he didn't try to hide. He had another kind of defiance. He was much bigger than life. And he was a very, very magnetic person. When I met him, he had just done a play called Femme Fatale at La Mama. And Femme Fatale was a play by Jackie Curtis. Jackie was hard to explain Jackie. Jackie was a Warhol star. The description I like of Jackie better than anything is a headline from the New York Times when Jackie's play Heaven Grand in Amber Orbit was pretty much a hit off Broadway. And they interviewed Jackie. It was a Sunday arts and leisure. And the headline read, not a boy, not a girl, just me, Jackie. And that was Jackie. This is the late 60s. So this is the forefront of a sexual revolution and the beginnings of an idea of gender fluidity and pansexuality and all sorts of things. So some days Jackie was a boy, some days Jackie was a girl. You know, kind of never knew what Jackie was going to be. Jackie said to me, uh, <laughs> she didn't want that. We called Jackie she, even though she was a boy. But she didn't want them to say, who is Jackie Curtis? She wanted them to say, what was Jackie Curtis? So Ingracia directed Femme Fatale, a play by Jackie Curtis, starring Jackie, Wayne County, Patti Smith, Penny Arcade. In case you I mean, Penny Arcade is a very well-known performance artist now. Jane County became a punk star and is now Jane County. He's the first transsexual punk rocker and figures heavily in this story. All of these people do, actually. Uh, Patti Smith, you've probably heard of Patti Smith. So this is kind of what was percolating downtown in 1970. We did World at a place called the New York Theater Ensemble, and I still remember walking up the stairs. It was on the second floor to this loft, <laughs> and Ingrassi is standing at the top of the stairs, and he looks at me and says, Darling, you don't have to audition for my play. Of course you can be in it. And that was the beginning of the next five years. So that day I met Lee Black Childers, who would feature heavily in Main Man, Cherry Vanilla, who was still Kathy Doherty, Wayne County, Jamie Andrews, also known as DiCarlo Lotz. Jamie would end up working at Main, Main Man. And a host of others, including Prindeville, Ohio, who was a kind of a semi-Warhol star. We weren't sure if she was black or white. She had bleached blonde hair, wore tons of makeup, and sort of would often come to his rehearsals uh, tripping on acid. That was always a lot of fun. So we went to work doing, doing World. And World became sort of a... a and Gracia had the ability to kind of create events. Again, his magnetic personality, and people wanted to be involved with Ingracia. He was very, very smart. World became an event. So everyone came to see World, and, <laughs> including Andy Warhol. So soon after this production, Warhol had something he was working on, and he asked Tony to work on it. So it became the play... Pork. This was a very, very exciting time in New York, London. It's post-war. It's baby boomers. Everything was new. Everything was exciting. Everything in music, art, theater. We were recreating the wheel, basically, or we thought we were. Sexually, drugs, whatever. Everything was new. It was a very, very exciting time. Now, Pork came from tape recordings, but this was new, too. There was a little tape recorder, a cassette player, that now was carryable. You could carry it with you, and it had an attachment to put on the phone. So it was, it, it was the newest gadget, and everybody was taping phone conversations, including Andy Warhol. So he was polaroiding everything, and he was, I mean, he did record the 20th century and spit it back at us, which is what all he said he was doing anyway. He was a human tape recorder. So this was part of it. And Pork is just as an important piece of his work as anything else, because it was exactly the same process as everything else. He took real conversations that he had tape recorded or Bridget Berlin tape recorded. It's, it's confusing as to whose tapes they actually were. Bridget Berlin, her father was part of the Hearst Corporation. So she was a well-to-do girl from Park Avenue who was a Warhol star. She had been in uh, Chelsea Girls, known as Bridget Polk. 
big girl, beautiful face, an artist. So she was taping, he was taping. He would sometimes give her $25 a tape, and he would buy the tapes from her. So he had the tapes transcribed and then gave them to Ingracia. There were hours and hours and hours and hours of tapes, supposedly 200 hours worth of tapes. So Ingracia's job was to kind of cut them down, pick ones, put them together in a sequence to create this quote-unquote play. And if you study Warhol's work, all he ever did was he took a photograph of an electric chair or of Liz Taylor or of Marilyn Monroe or of whatever, and he kind of manipulated it and prettied it up a little bit and presented it as, and then it became a silk screen, it became art. So this was the same thing. It was like taking something from life and kind of prettying it up a little bit and then putting it on stage and saying, this is a play. It wasn't any different than putting a, you know, an illustration of a Campbell soup can on the wall and saying, this is art. So that's what the process was. We did the play at La Mama. I played Andy. It's because Andy's the character in the play, because all the conversations are with Andy. <laughs> it was a great role because Andy didn't really talk much, but he was the center of attention. So I sat on stage and everyone talked to me, but all I had to say was, oh, really? Or, oh, oh re what happened? You know, I, I, it wasn't hard to memorize the lines, let's put it that way. <laughs> I didn't know Andy before this, but I just sort of would watch Andy. And I wasn't a big druggie, but I had done a drug called Escatrol. Escatrol is a diet pill. And what Escatrol did is it sped you up and calmed you down at the same time. And coincidentally, because I thought all I could think of when I looked at Andy was Escatrol, but he was actually on something called, I think, Obatrol, which is the same thing. It was because that was very popular also in the late 60s. People would take teeny little bits of speed, especially people like Andy who were so productive. And they took it very minimally. They took it every day, and that made them work much, 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 much more. So I was looking at him, and I thought there was something speedy about him, except he was very calm and very still and very quiet. So the two contradictory things happening at the same time. That was my impression. And again, it was correct. <laughs> but he wasn't like jumping up and down. He wasn't loud. He wasn't, you know, gesticulating wildly. Very still, very quiet. And you could hear it in the dialogue because he was kind of, Andy liked to kind of stir it up. So he would constantly be getting people going or getting them to entertain him or pitting them against each other. So, yes, his brain was always percolating, but there was a stillness. So that's basically how I prepared for it. Then, of course, I bleached my hair because we didn't have enough money to buy a wig. <laughs> and I always loved doing makeup. I used to paint portraits, so I was pretty good at painting my face to look like him. And I actually looked quite a bit like him. Once I was all painted up with the hair and everything. Not when we were, so, I mean, there are pictures of us together, and it was obviously I'm not Andy Warhol, but later David Bailey did a documentary where it was, a, I thought it was a brilliant idea. He interviewed all these people, and then he would cut to Andy Warhol, but me as Andy Warhol, doing a quote, one of Warhol's famous quotes. This was the like, kind of the structure of the documentary. And then at the end of it, I took off the wig and said, I'm not even Andy Warhol. I'm just an actor that plays him. <laughs> anyway, but it was a little bit ruined because he had scenes with Warhol, too. So it's like, mm. I remember in 68 when he was shot and I thought, oh, no, he can't die because I felt that my destiny somehow was pointed in that direction. And for the milieu I was in, for the genre of theater I liked, for the community I entered in downtown New York, he was the linchpin. He was the king. So uh, it was a Warhol world. You know, the rest of us only cleaned it or something like that. I don't know. So we did pork, and the Warhols were very—they um, wanted to do a Broadway play. I mean, they wanted this to go to Broadway because that was part of the whole shtick. That really wasn't happening. But this guy from London came kind of sniffing around. His name was Ira Gale. He was not a producer, but he was an art dealer. I think he was Andy's dealer in London. So he wanted to produce it. So since they didn't really have anyone else interested, they gave him the rights to produce it in London. And off we went to London. Not the whole cast, but the core of the cast. Then we had to hire an English cast. So in June of 1971, off we went to London on the great adventure. 
<laughs> then again, and Gracia had to have open calls. And who comes to the open call? Dana Gillespie to audition for the understudy for the role of Pork, Bridget Polk, Bridget Pork, Amanda Pork in the play. By the way, Cherry Vanilla was not in the New York production, but they replaced the girl that played that part in New York with Cherry. So Cherry came to London with us. Lee Childers was the stage manager. Wayne County played Volva or Viva Superstar. Jamie Andrews played Paul, Paul Morrissey. I played Andy. Jerry Miller was kind of a hooker superstar. We think it was Ingrid Superstar. We don't know who that was. In London, in this open call, Dana Gillespie showed up to audition for the role of Pork. She would have been good, actually, too, but he didn't hire her. We always thought she stole a script and gave it to David Bowie. (laughs) And that's how the song Andy Warhol came about. Let me backtrack a minute. Because, oh, I would be sitting there as Andy reading magazines. And one of the things I read was Rolling Stone. And in the Rolling Stone of that spring, 1971, was a small article about this boy named David Bowie. He had come here on his Mercury promotional tour. He didn't have a working visa. They sent him over here to meet press and radio DJs. And he did like a little acoustic thing in L.A. that Rodney Bingenheimer organized, I think. Anyway, so there's a little article about him. But the thing that fascinated us was he was supposedly straight, married, but he wore a dress. So that was kind of intriguing. He wore a dress and he wore makeup and he was kind of pretty. It was like, hmm, who is this? <laughs> he wore big elephant bells. His hair was very long, kind of golden brown blonde. He was very pretty, pretty English boy, soft. It was pre-hunky-dory, but it didn't have the hard edge that Bronson later brought to his sound. So he was kind of folky, um, folky pretty. <laughs> we were wild and carrying on and had bleached hair and makeup for days. And all right, we got to London. We lived in Earl's Court Square <laughs> in a building called Langham Mansion. It was a huge flat, which soon became dubbed as Pig Mansion. Because, and that came about shortly after we got there, we were going to do this interview and photo session. We were all excited. So we did it, and we're carrying on, and we're like, we're not exactly discreet. We're wild and crazy. And none of us had ever heard of News of the World, but it was for the News of the World. <laughs> of course, they took everything that we were doing and saying and blew it up even bigger and made us sound like the most outrageous, vulgar people on earth, you know, the dirtiest people in the world, which we were close to, but... Again, because of Ingracia and his energy, I mean, I was basically a quiet boy from upstate. You know, I think individually we were one person, but together we built off each other, and there was a big energy about the whole group, fueled by Ingracia's manic, hysterical energy, plus the fact that we were very conscious of being Americans in England. And England... As much as we all loved London, it was kind of sleepy compared to, you know, people were, they were kind of uh, (laughs) calm and discreet. They didn't raise their voices. They were polite. We were none of those things. We were loud, ugly Americans, basically, and kind of reveling in it. We liked attracting attention. So our apartment did become known as Pig Mansion. You know, this is like grad school, except it was Warhol. Here we were, uh, you know, we were on a salary. Everything was being paid for. It was a dream summer. We were in magazines and newspapers. People recognized. I mean, it was, we could meet anybody that we wanted to meet. We hung out with Sal Minio and Jill Hayworth and Barbara Parkins from Peyton Place and Bud Court, who had just been in the movie with Ruth Gordon. And, and a Rod Stewart came to our flat. And it was like, the day before, we were no one in New York. <laughs> But the English, including young David, this is all leading up to what happened next. The English all took everything at face value that we were Warhol stars. We really weren't. We were just from the ridiculous and we were acting as if. But in New York, we weren't perceived as Warhol stars. We may have been known for theater, but now we were Warhol stars. And I was Warhol. (laughs) 
that was freaky because occasionally people would act like I was Warhol. I'm like, okay, whatever. Now, I guess you want to talk about David Bowie a little bit. You know, I met David Bowie. Well, Lee was a photographer, or he was saying he was. He was a photographer. He had a camera. Let's put it that way. He had a camera, and he took a lot of pictures. And Cherry, Kathy Doherty, she was still Kathy Doherty, and she was Kathy Doherty in the play. But she had this other life, this groupie life. And she decided that while she was there, and I don't know if it was real. I don't think it actually was. There was a magazine in the U.S. called Circus. So she was going to do a column called Cherry Vanilla Scoops for You and write about rock and roll in London and send it to the magazine. It would be Cherry Vanilla Scoops for You with pictures by Lee Black Childers. She used this basically to get in backstage at all the shows she wanted to go to and bring Lee with her. So that's what they did. They went to a lot of shows. And then they saw that David Bowie was playing a little place called the Country Club. So Cherry and Lee and Wayne County went to see David at the Country Club. I didn't go. And they deny it now. (laughs) Well, Wayne doesn't or Jane doesn't, but Cherry does. They were kind of bored because (laughs) it was quite, you know, it was small. He was doing acoustic music, very quiet. I think Mick Ronson was with him, but on another acoustic guitar. It wasn't a band. He knew who they were. He announced Cherry from the audience, which gave her a big thrill. And then they invited them to see the play. They invited David and Angie. Angie had just had the baby, Zoe. Angie was David's wife at the time. Angela Bowie. (laughs) So they invited them to come to see the show. They came backstage, and that's when I met David, Angela, Mick Ronson, Tony DeFries, and Dana Gillespie. She was also with them. Now, that night, David wasn't even, I mean, he wasn't even pretty particularly. He took a stringy brown hair and a turtleneck sweatshirt. And Angie was kind of... um, not dykey looking, but I think she had like a pantsuit on. I mean, they were not extraordinary looking people. Dana was very beautiful. Dana Gillespie is part of this podcast. And she was, you know, she had been a water skiing champion. And she was a singer from an early age. She appeared in a lot of uh, West End productions. Very beautiful girl with a golden mane of hair. And I think she was a, kind of dating Tony at the time. And, and Tony was kind of, he had, uh, <laughs> It's a little strange looking. (laughs) No offense, Tony. He does have a very large nose. And he was very skinny at the time, which made his nose look larger. And he had a lot of hair, like a big afro. And Tony's energy is very quiet. So he didn't say much. Ronson doesn't really talk much. Angela is very effusive. So she probably, you know, she was the one that really was flitting around. But they were going to the sombrero. And we used to go to the Sombrero. The Sombrero was a gay club on Kensington High Street. It's in a basement. It was a restaurant, yours and mine, Sombrero. I don't know if it was a restaurant during the day and a disco at night, whatever. But you walk downstairs, and it was a dance floor that lit up. It had a DJ. It was fun. There was kind of a balcony that went around this dance floor. So people could really make an entrance and did. There were like a lot of outrageous European queens that went to this place. And this is where David and Angie liked to go. You know, he had been using the sombrero as kind of a laboratory, the sombrero with that staircase and the balcony. And he could try different things out at the sombrero, you know, different looks or different this, different that, to see what got a reaction, what didn't get a reaction. We went there occasionally, but we didn't go to gay clubs particularly in London. The Hard Rock Cafe had just opened, and actually the Hard Rock Cafe was the place to go that summer. We would go there. We went to a lot of places. Not that much to yours and mine, but we did go there from time to time. I'm kind of, uh, I think I need a break. (laughs) So that's Tony Zanetta explaining how he came to enter David Bowie's orbit in London in the summer of 1971. In the next episode, Z takes us into Andy Warhol's factory in New York and recalls the historic and infamous first meeting between Andy and David. Please hit subscribe to make sure the next episode arrives via your chosen podcast provider and the Main Man website has an ever-growing archive of amazing memorabilia relevant to each episode, so it's definitely worth checking out. I'm Des Shaw and this is a Zinc Media MM Tech production.
Thanks for listening. <laughs>